Support from today's show comes from Incorporate. Incorporate's a site where, surprise, you can incorporate a business. Use the link in the show notes, thebiggamehunter.us forward slash incorporate. And they are a fairly priced firm. After all, if you're starting a business or you have a friend who's going to start a business or a member of your family that's starting a business, you got to do it the legal way. Incorporate will do it for you. And with that, we'll be back in just one moment. Episode 2185 of No BS Job Search Advice Radio. I'm Jeff Alton, the Big Game Hunter, and welcome to Wednesday. And today's show is an interview I did with Patton McDowell, who runs a consulting firm for the nonprofit industry, works with nonprofit leadership, also has a podcast that he'll mention in the show. He is very good about finding work and helping nonprofits operate. And today we're going to find out about how to find a position with nonprofits, what they look for. And I think what's particularly interesting is if you listen to the show, you know, if you've never thought about working for a nonprofit, it's something to learn about because there are great opportunities with them. Hope you find this helpful and give it an honest review wherever you listen to the show. And we'll be back in one moment. Today's show is brought to you by Fiverr. Fiverr is a service where, frankly, you can outsource a lot of tasks to someone else and have them do it very inexpensively. If you've ever watched or observed the show notes, not the show notes, but the transcriptions for this show, what you'll see is work that's been done by someone I've hired on Fiverr. I've also had uh, editing for my books done on Fiverr. I've had a variety of different functions done there. And I've done it for years. It saves a lot of time. It's very inexpensive. And I'll just simply say, use the link in the show notes. It helps support the advertiser and lets them know that this show has meaning for you. And with that, we'll be back in just one moment. So my guest today is Patton McDowell. Patton has spent his 30-year career helping talented individuals effectively lead nonprofit organizations. The founder of PMA Consulting, he and his colleagues have worked with the leaders of over 240 organizations in every nonprofit sector. Patton especially enjoys coaching aspiring leaders through his unique mastermind program and designing strategic plans, expanding fundraising programs. Why do nonprofits need fundraising anyway, right? <laughs> and training volunteer board leaders. He's also the host of the weekly podcast, Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Patton, welcome. Jeff, delighted to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this and I have been for, for some time now. So nonprofit, for-profit, what are the misconceptions about working for a nonprofit? Yeah, well, Jeff, I, I know you should be able to do that in about 30, 35 <laughs> seconds, right? Well, it may take us a few more than that, Jeff, but I know you and I can unpack it. And again, I'm delighted for the opportunity here because I love to get talented people to consider the nonprofit career path. And so I would be delighted for individuals and your listeners to consider it. But I do think there are misconceptions sometimes that here's number one. I volunteer for my favorite nonprofit. I have a wonderful feel-good Saturday experience with an event and, and perhaps think that would translate to a full-time job. And so number one, I would say be careful yeah, that your fun Saturday volunteer experience is not necessarily uh, what the full-time job would look like. So just be careful that you may not be getting a full view. And it's funny, you know, because I know of people who've, who actually think that way. Right. And, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to the fun house. We're going to have a party. Working at a nonprofit is going to be a party, too. Everyone's going to have fun. Not always the case. And again, I, I acknowledge it's, it's, it's often well-intentioned because the cause you're supporting is a feel-good cause. You know, Jeff, I worked for Special Olympics right out of college. And, and so that uh, many people have experienced that organization. They volunteered maybe when they were in high school or as an adult. And it is a powerful, good experience. And, and you get that working for the organization, but it's not just that volunteer experience that maybe some people are limited in their exposure. 
It's funny, I've been involved with an international men's nonprofit for a long time. And I eventually rose to a role where I was leading their retreats, which wow. was a, a fairly significant thing for them. And there'd be people who'd come to staff them and work for me. They'd have a great time. And for me, it was a job. <laughs> and I have a responsibility for the safety of everyone coming, making sure we deliver a great experience for everyone. I'm looking at it at a high level and then down to the minutia. That's not what people are doing when they're coming to the weekend. Such a good point. You know, they show up on that Saturday and using your example or mine, but you were working months before that day or that weekend for the retreat. And that's, of course, what I'm suggesting, that be careful that while your feel-good experience is important, it's not entirely what it would be like to work for that organization. So true. How else do people have a misconception about working for a nonprofit? Um, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but there's just a, a significant lack of resources. Often, particularly those who I call lateral entries, they, they want to move from the corporate or uh, for-profit sector into nonprofit, and they just are, are hit with that reality of, wow, I don't have an HR person to call anymore. I don't have an IT person to help me. Uh, it is uh, the same amount of work at, with less resources. And so I think I have seen some unfortunate nonprofit careers derailed early because they just didn't fully evaluate the challenge of trying to do this important work with significantly less resources. And that's interesting because I know of quite a few wealthy nonprofits. For which Indeed. There's no issue whatsoever. <laughs> right. If anything, it's stupid money at times. You're, you're right. I would suggest that's at the high end of the pyramid in the nonprofit world. Most nonprofits are, are operating, and to their credit, with great efficiency. There's not a lot of wasted resource there, but you, know, you just have to be clear on that when you come in. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and perhaps wear more hats than you did in a larger, perhaps, for-profit organization. Is it equivalent to being in a startup environment? Um, again, limited resources, exceedingly long hours? How, how do the hours part of this work in as well? Yes, great point. And, and not to suggest that people aren't working long hours in any sector, including for-profit, but yes, nonprofit um, can be, in fact, a lot of my coaching with nonprofit leaders is preventing burnout, Jeff, because they can work uh, tirelessly, especially with a cause that's so powerful, they, they just feel like they're not getting enough done. And so you have to be sensitive to that overload effect. It's interesting. Um, you know, again, the idea of avoiding burnout. Yes. You know, it obviously exists everywhere. But given the fact that you raised this as, as a subject, it suggests it's even more acute in nonprofit than it is in for-profit. Am I reading that correctly? You're absolutely right. And again, I don't know statistics in every sector, but I know in particular nonprofit fundraisers, as you mentioned before, as a critical element to generating revenue, are turning over at a rate of every 18 months wow. in many nonprofits. So imagine not just the burnout effect of those individuals who are arriving and leaving quickly, but it creates a whole problem with everyone else in the organization. So if you're leading an organization and your team is constantly turning over, that of course adds stress to your life. So it's another of those misconceptions, Jeff, that I think is worth mentioning. And I'm going to zero in on that one, in particular, the fundraiser side of this. Because I've, I've worked with fundraisers and helping them land new roles. And you're right, 18 months was about what I was seeing in their in their bios for how long they were landing, sometimes less, rarely more. Uh, it's sad, but true. We parachute in talented people like you and I've worked with, but often the, the job description is not clear, which is again, among the advice you and I could offer listeners thinking, make sure the job description is clear. I see a lot of people hired in a quote fundraising role, but that's not fully defined. Does that mean special event management? Does that mean marketing and communications? Does that mean annual direct mail activity? Does it mean foundation and grant writing? Uh, I could unpack fundraising having done that job myself for 20 years. My um, condolences. <laughs> exactly. I'm still recovering from that. But you have to be clear 
because someone may describe it as quote fundraising, but you need to ask good questions to assure you know what that means. And in the work that I do with people, that's one of the things I always insist that they ask about. It's yes. about the expectations in the role, how the firm's going to evaluate success over the first, I have better language than what I'm using now, but over the first three months and over the first year. So an individual has a, a sense of how they're going to be evaluated. And that lays out what the expectations are that allows them to deeper dive uh, into areas uh, and understand how they're going to be measured and what success is going to look like. But so often without that kind of coaching, people walk in with that happy smile button face only to have the smile just wiped off. It's such good advice, Jeff, that you're uh, suggesting because I, I think, and I'm being intentionally provocative because there are exceptions, but most nonprofits do a poor job of orienting new talent. And, and I say that with some degree of respect because if the executive director is overloaded to start with, they often are so excited to get the new person in. They're like, good, glad you're here, get started. And then that lack of orientation, unfortunately, I think sets things in motion that may not work out and thus we lose them 18 months later. And thus, if you were advising a fundraiser, and then we'll get off this topic a little bit sure. onto some other things, but if you were advising a fundraiser on the way in the door, knowing that the executive director is overtaxed and isn't going to orient them well, what would you advise them to do in order to, uh, shall we say, uh, onboard themselves? Because that's, that's really what's going to be. That's exactly what I'd say. You yeah. need to create, be responsible for your own orientation. Take the job description in whatever format it is and break it down. I think executive directors would delight if you were to come in and say, okay, I see that I'm in charge of A, B, and C. Let's break that down. Let's, hopefully they've gotten some good data before they arrived as to what those functions achieved in the previous year or years. But if you're not getting that orientation, make one for yourself. Who are the 10 people you need to meet associated with the organization? So if I'm a fundraiser, I want to know individual philanthropists. I want to know corporations and sponsors. I want to know foundations and grant sources so that I understand the kind of ecosystem in which I'm going to have to operate. And thus, how much of this should you do on the way in versus once you arrive? Could you I, offer some insights? they should be on your list of questions, Jeff, in the interview process. You're exactly right. I want to hear stories from the hiring agent, if you will. Tell me about the individual philanthropists that support your nonprofit. Tell me about those corporations. How did those relationships build? And what do we need to do to make them even stronger? If you can't get good answers then, then maybe you should be careful about following through and actually accepting the job. Because the last thing folks you want to do is to step in and to use this old expression, be the one armed paper hanger without understanding <laughs> the way the wallpaper is supposed to be laid out. I've, I have seen recovering one armed paper hangers indeed. And it's a shame because the intentions are good, I think, on both sides, yeah. but the connectivity doesn't occur. Yeah. And that's part of the overwhelm of the environments that are under resourced, I know. Where else do, are, do people arrive with misunderstandings or misconceptions about working in nonprofit? Well, you know, I, I think they struggle with clarity about exactly what the job is. Sometimes I see a loss in translation between, let's say if I were in sales in a for-profit sector, thinking that'll automatically transfer to philanthropic or fundraising activity. And indeed, there are skills that are transferable. But what I've found sometimes that inhibits progress is understand the, the vocabulary of the nonprofit sector. And, and not just to be respectful to your new boss or potential new boss, but you do need to understand that funders speak slightly different language around what I would call a philanthropic cycle of activity. Now, is it similar to a sales cycle in a for-profit venture? Sure. But... I think nonprofits, I talk to a lot of nonprofit leaders like, yeah, I think this person might be good, but I wish they had translated a little bit better how their relationship management skills would apply to our nonprofit. Because it is, Jeff, about relationships. 
whether it's sales, whether it's fundraising, whether it's grant applications, it is about that. But do your homework. And of course, we can talk about that. But that's where I'm suggesting people can get better. And thus, let's go into that because I think it's yep. great stuff. Let's talk about some of the language and how to translate it from for-profit to non-profit. So that, this reminds me of conversations I've had with people leaving the military. Interesting. Now, when you leave the military, there's military speak and there's civilian speak. And there's right. military behavior and civilian behavior. Right. And I, tell them, I tell the military guys, you're used to hard work. What the civilian sector considers hard work, you're going to laugh at. That's <laughs> such a good point and, and, and a great comparison. Thank you. And thus, could you, could you offer some comparisons in vocabulary and how to express the for-profit work? I and mean, you just mentioned one in passing there to the um, nonprofit space. Again, understanding the different roles of philanthropy that when you go in to discuss it, sales in, in a for-profit venture, it can be broken down differently in nonprofit. How you attract and, and invite investment from individuals is different than seeking a corporate sponsorship for your nonprofit, which is different again from seeking a grant from a foundation. So simply understanding their different types of revenue streams coming into nonprofit would illustrate that you get it that it's not one size fits all in terms of revenue generation, how you appeal to those individuals, how you appeal to the companies, that alone would get you, I think, a head start on someone else who is really looking at a one size fits all approach. So for example, someone who's done proposal writing, that may translate into grant writing. Indeed. Someone, and, someone who's involved in business development work, might be more involved in philanthropic cultivation. You know, the farmer in sales versus the hunter in sales, the farmer might work very well in that philanthropic cultivation. Absolutely. And, and it's important, Jeff, as you pointed out earlier, do your homework, understand where the revenue comes from for the nonprofit about which you're seeking a job. In other words, are they largely dependent on grant funding? then yeah, you need to come in and talk about how your proposal writing skills would apply to their grant world. But however, if this organization is largely dependent on individual and family foundations, then that might be a different mindset and a different approach. And therefore you translate according to where their revenue already comes from. And for those who aren't familiar with the term family foundation, we're all in family office. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, and it's important to note, and you know this, but in the nonprofit sector, you know, there's about $400 billion given away in the United States each year. 80% of it comes from individuals and families, and sometimes through their family foundations. But the point is, that's why I'm always suggesting you want to be conversant in individual relationship building, because that's where the money is. And nonprofits need to focus on that, not to dismiss the big foundations, the grants, the corporate sponsorships, the monies with individuals. And so your understanding of that dynamic will help you be more successful. And thus any place where you have sold into that market, into that clientele, into those organizations, seems like it would serve you uh, to present to that type of nonprofit whose funding sources come from, from those organizations. My Such goodness. a great point. You, you can always connect the dot, do your homework again. You're talking to a nonprofit who currently sponsors them. You may well have connections within those organizations. Reach out to them. Talk to those corporate sponsors or families that you might know. Why do they give to the nonprofit that you're seeking employment? And understand that dynamic. Think about how powerful that is to go come into the interview and say, well, yes, in fact, I do know XYZ Corporation. I've worked with them or I know some of the leadership in that family foundation, it allows the nonprofit leader to say, okay, I see this person could translate their skills and their network in a way that will benefit our nonprofit. And I'm gonna jump on that last word you threw in there, your network? <laughs> Indeed. I, I, and, and if you're getting into the nonprofit space, strategically expand your network. 
I would say before you go interview for a job with a nonprofit, talk to somebody who's doing that job at an equivalent nonprofit across town. That would give you some great advice. And often nonprofit leaders are willing to share their story if you're respectful in the outreach. So if I'm interviewing for a fundraising job at one organization, I'm gonna look and see who else is in that sector and go talk to the fundraiser who's working for a different but similar nonprofit. I guarantee he or she will give you some great insight to talk about their challenges and opportunities. Therefore, your network appears even stronger when you interview. And I'm, I'm gonna play the, you know, the ignorant applicant for a moment. <laughs> Why would they talk to me if I'm going to go talk you know, trying to find another organization who does the same work you know, that they do. Most nonprofits have unique subsets of funders. And so I would say there is a spirit uh, of, uh, it's not a, a minimal kind of environment in turn. There's an abundance mentality to most nonprofits. And so in fact, if you reached out and said, hey, I, I'm impressed with what you're doing over there. I'm exploring something over here at a different organization. I would almost guarantee there'd be a willingness to have some conversation, not as competitive, in other words, Jeff, as I think sometimes the for-profit sector can be. Agreed. Now, knowing your work, you know, you obviously work with boards, you work with leaders and organizations. What are the challenges that they're facing that you can share without being specific to any one organization that would allow someone to understand what they might be stepping into? Yeah, the, the biggest challenge, I guess, on a board side sometimes is prioritizing. Nonprofits spread too thin, which in fact leads to some of the turnover issues we talked about. If the organization does not have clarity, and much of my work is in fact strategic planning and achieving kind of a prioritization. There's so much to be done in these sectors, whether it's healthcare or education or arts and culture, you have to find focus. And that focus though leads to not only more success, but I think greater attraction and retention of talent. If I know what I need to do when I get here, and so that to me is a challenge that nonprofits can help themselves. And in fact, a benefit of that will be talent retention. Do they tend to fear missing opportunities because of their, because of the idea of focusing or do they just breathe a sigh of relief that someone is, has channeled their energy in one particular way? I think it's sometimes a little bit of both, but I, I think you're right. The majority is relief at clarity. But occasionally there is that, well, but, you know, we, are we going to miss out? You know, FOMO here is a reality, if, particularly if a board member comes in and says, well, I saw that a big funder gave a lot of money to that other nonprofit across town. And shouldn't we then chase that same money? And, and of course, my counsel is almost always don't chase the money. Focus on your strategic priorities. The money will come to you, the right money. But unfortunately, sometimes organizations fear they're going to miss out and then they spread themselves too thin and create an environment they can't escape. Right, we're back to that paper hanger again. Exactly. What other sort of misconceptions exist uh, for people who are looking at nonprofit? Um, that there's not, they, they don't fully understand the increasing depth to the profession, that it's not just what maybe 20 years ago people thought, well, I can volunteer and fundraise that fundraising, for example, is in fact a profession. There is certification. The CFRE certification is an example that is uh, you know, internationally accredited uh, study and recognition. And so uh, I, I think that's something I would point out that some people think they can walk into, a, you wouldn't walk into an accounting job or you wouldn't walk into a legal career without having to do the appropriate and requisite study well, I would suggest the nonprofit profession is increasingly professional in its dynamic. There are increasing number of college and even graduate programs now in nonprofit leadership, management, fundraising. And so I think sometimes a misconception. Now, again, I don't want to scare anybody off, but I just don't want them to walk in and think, OK, well, I can do that because I you know, read a brochure about fundraising and I'm ready to go. And that's the way amateurs behave. Indeed. And, and exactly I say it that right. way, folks, because 
so many of you from a job hunting perspective, I see it all the time, and it's not specific to nonprofit, it's about every sector, you're amateurs about it. And the research that you do is very thin, your preparation before interviews is even thinner, and the result you walk in and you get blindsided, which when you're doing transitions from for profit to nonprofit, it's the last thing in the world you want to do is to come across as an amateur who's blindsided by some of the, the things that you'd be walking into. Even if you get in the door, Jeff, at that point, you're going to struggle sooner than later. So that's why I'm glad you and I are bringing it up now that uh, you just don't want to get into a, a situation that you're going to fail ultimately. Right. Cause, and, and that's the key thing. You get hired, you wash out. Indeed. <laughs> and that's who, the risk. And you don't want to do that, obviously. You, you know, you're betting the farm on a transition like this, and thus in betting the farm, again, a great metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I love that. But it's uh, appropriate. But it's yeah. appropriate. You're pushing all your chips, chips into the center of the table. Another good one that allows you to say, I'm gambling everything on this. And I love when people do it, but they're calculated about it. Yeah, indeed. And well, and that's why I'm glad you do this so well through your programming and content, um, do your homework. And among the advice I offer someone in these areas is to avoid exactly what you said, that burnout effect. Now, time is always finite here. Yes, <laughs> and I wanna yes, make indeed. sure we, we cover everything that we should. What haven't we covered yet that we really should uh, in giving people a sense of what it's like in nonprofit, how to find work in nonprofit, Actually, we haven't talked about how to find work in nonprofit. Um, Great segue. Uh, I'm just so skillful. <laughs> You're good at this, Jeff. It's clear. And, and that leads to a point I make to someone who comes to me and says, you know what, Patton? I'm thinking about making the jump. Tell me what I should do. All right. Well, here's what I say. Strategically network. Strategically network. What I would try to do is find two or three persons in your community who are doing a job you think you would like to do kind of what you and I were talking about earlier. Um, so even before you get to interviewing anywhere, talk to a few, because you may find there, there, there are distinct differences. Speaking of misconceptions, Jeff, working in healthcare philanthropy and nonprofit is different than education, different again than arts and culture or a faith-based organization. Talk to some people who are doing the work, not just kind of go and volunteer one day, but talk to people that are doing the work. And I think that will help, you know, maybe strengthen your resolve to work in the sector, which is great, but it also may raise some good questions for you to ponder. And my big thing about that is people have fantasies about what it's like to do something. It's a good way to put it. And the reality between what it's really like and the fantasy can be fairly stark. Uh, it's better to do it on the way in uh, when you're first dating. Yes, <laughs> after yes, You've yes. gotten married and you go, oh, I made a terrible mistake. Well, uh, speaking... Speaking of dating, Jeff, that leads to some other advice I always offer. Strategically volunteer. And what I mean by that is, yes, do the fun day of volunteer event with your family on a Saturday, whatever, the 5K run, you know, the gala event. But if you really want to better understand the organization, talk to some staff about volunteering on a more extended basis. Join a committee. Join the board volunteer for an initiative that requires multiple weeks or months to get to know staff and board on the inside. That is significantly different, I believe. Again, using my Special Olympics example, it's one thing to show up and hand out awards on a Saturday. It's another thing to be on the games committee that starts meeting six months earlier. And as a volunteer, then you'll get a better idea of what it's really like to work before actually getting married and working there full time. Because unfortunately in the United States, one out of two marriages ends in divorce <laughs> and you don't want to be that statistic professionally. Indeed. Such a good point. Thank you. You're throwing out a lot of good points in my direction and you're making a lot too. Well, what else should someone do in order to prepare for, for exploring or, or getting that job with the nonprofit? A, a part of strategic networking, in addition to identifying individuals that work in roles that you aspire to, to work, identify the community networking organizations. In other words, almost every community has a united way, has a community foundation, 
has an association for fundraising professionals chapter. Think, identify who those organizations are. They have events, they have networking opportunities, they are great opportunities to learn, meet people, and often find out about job openings. So I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, so I'm always steering people to those Charlotte-based entities so that they can learn and network. And I would suggest that's something too, that look at your local community colleges and universities for their nonprofit curriculum. I guarantee it exists somewhere. Often those programs are also hubs for nonprofit, nonprofit seeking talent. And final point there, Jeff, is think about enrolling in a class yourself. You know, it doesn't have to be a full, um, you know, you don't have to go through a degree program to maybe take a course or two, strengthen your knowledge. And by the way, you'll probably find some good networking opportunities as a result from registering for a class that's taught by nonprofit leaders in your community. Do you find that the online classes, again, putting aside the networking aspect of taking right. the class, are, the, are there online classes that are available that you're aware of that you hold that you give any credence to? Absolutely. And again, I'll use the AFP, Association for Fundraising Professionals. There's an international component. You can just go to that website and find out more of their courses, both paid and free. And as well as most of the local chapters, AFP offers um, right now, of course, many of them are still in a hybrid mode. But once they get back out, you may find more in person. But yes, there is good online content that you should absolutely take advantage of. This is fabulous. Last check, anything that we should cover? I think and you've, I'm looking back at my notes here. Um, oh, be a student of job descriptions, Jeff. That's kind of one of my kind of advice points. Um, you and I talked about earlier, understanding the job and what I encourage people to do. And in my mastermind program, I have them identify what are their ideal jobs, seek out job descriptions that match the ideal job and, and really study it for what it tells you. Because I think a lot of times, first time applicants don't read the fine print. And it's things that you can learn and understand what organizations are asking for so you can better translate your skills to address their needs. And thus a specific question about doing that for a resume. Yes. So in the example of grant writing uh, as part of what you're trying to demonstrate and you're a proposal, uh, proposal writer and for profit, would you in parenthesis put the phrase grant writer or grant writing or, or grant writing equivalent in order to number one have the keyword show up but number absolutely. two demonstrate the trans translation for them absolutely right and good example jeff of using the nonprofit vocabulary in your resume in your linkedin in your other kind of social media profile information so that you translate more quickly to a nonprofit setting because the skills there, I don't want you to lose it because you didn't say grant writing and you use corporate speak instead. Beautiful. Patton, this has been fabulous. How can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Find me on LinkedIn. Patton McDowell is my name. Um, and my website, pattonmcdowell.com is a great way to see more about our firm and the work we do both with nonprofit organizations and with individuals. You were nice to lift up the mastermind program for your listeners that are in the nonprofit sector. That has been the most rewarding thing I've done over the last two years. We're bringing together nonprofit talent and putting them together in a virtual environment so they can, in a safe space, explore career development. So that may be of interest to those of your listeners already in the sector. And then thanks, like uh, when they're listening to you, Jeff, they may also want to listen to your path to nonprofit leadership. Thank you for lifting up my podcast. What might be helpful to those pondering nonprofit leadership is I'm talking to nonprofit leaders every week. And one of the questions I often ask them, what are you looking for when you hire? And so for someone pondering the profession, listen to some of the podcast episodes, you may get some insight as to what nonprofit leaders are hiring for and thus maybe sharpen your case accordingly. Excellent. Patton, thank you. 
So that's today's show. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, here are a few things I can do to help you with your job search beyond simply being your coach. First of all, I've got a new book out called The Right Answers to Tough Interview Questions. It is like a cookbook with answers to tons of interview questions that you're going to be asked on interviews. And if you pair it up with my other new book, The Ultimate Job Interview Framework, they are a a terrific pair of books to help you with interviewing. In addition, I have a new service where you can practice mock interviews. If you go to thebiggamehunter.us forward slash mock, I've got a service there, very inexpensive, like $99, where we have mock interviews set up. I'm going to be adding more to it very soon, but you can record your answers to them And then I can critique them and help you perform better on them. You probably have noticed my show notes are pretty thorough with products and services that can help you with your search. And connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash the big game hunter. Lastly, my website has a ton of great information. That's thebiggamehunter.us. Now, if you're not ready to go there and Go through the blog, put the address in your phone, thebiggamehunter.us, Jeff Altman. So this way, when you're ready to go, you have a way of getting back to my website. Hope you have a terrific day, and most importantly, be great!